A lot of our work focuses on identifying and, and trying to change concentrations of corporate power that uh, extract wealth from communities, um, you know, sort of the typical Main Street to Wall Street thing. Um, an example of something I've been working on a lot lately that uh, kind of speaks to that is uh, restaurant meal delivery apps, Grubhub, um, Uber Eats, Postmates, DoorDash, uh, they dominate about 95% of the delivery market. Um, before the pandemic, restaurants used them mostly as a way to um, expand their market and bring in new customers. And it didn't account for a lot of their sales. So the fees they charge weren't really an issue for them. Now with the pandemic, restaurants are, are very dependent on uh, delivery apps um, and it's become a real, a real challenge. So I've been doing a lot of work uh, with that, for example, and discovered in the process of doing it um, that not only are their rates exorbitant, you know, 30% or more of uh, a meal cost uh, when a restaurant might make three to 6% profit, um, but they also do some fairly deceptive things like listing restaurants without their permission on their websites and, um, uh, you know, jacking up the prices online. And if the food quality isn't good when somebody gets it, people think that the restaurant's responsible when the restaurant didn't even know they were listed on the website. So lots of stuff like that. So we work on that sort of, uh, you know, untangling where there are concentrations of power that make it an, un an uneven playing field for, uh, for small businesses. Um, so that's kind of what we, what we do. We've, um, we just delivered a policy brief today to um, members of Congress and some key organizations on uh, ways that we think the new administration might be able to um, strengthen uh, federal policies and programs for small business development. Um, so we do lots of that sort of work, uh, research and advocacy. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so one question I had um, was starting to notice, and you've worked with a lot of downtown, in particular, I think, retail um, sure. revitalization. And I think people change when there's pain. So I think like there's been a lot of pain and people were willing to change. But I think also there's an opportunity to be proactive and kind of see things when kind of look ahead and see when this is you know, what's coming down the pike. And um, I guess what are some of the things you've seen that have been successful in communities where they've added new industries or kind of diversified their economy? Um, you mean in, in general or during the pandemic or? In general. In general. Um, well, uh, you know, uh, um, um, lots of things. It's hard to uh, uh, kind of focus on one, but um, I would say that there are um, uh, a couple of things. Uh, one is that um, it's important to uh, to have a clear sense of what you want the community to be. Um, and I say that meaning um, that not only do your plans then derive from it, your comprehensive plans and things like that, but um, one of the things about communities that are very dependent on tourism is that uh, there comes a point in time, I find, when communities begin to sort of feel like the like like new business development should cater to the visitors. Mm -hmm. And in reality, what makes a place distinctive is that people come there to see how the locals live. They want to know what it's like to be there and be a native. They want to eavesdrop on the table next to them in the restaurant, and they want to, you know, see what kinds of things people there buy and how they, what they do for entertainment and uh, things like that. And so that's a, a, a critical thing, I think, is having that, that, that vision of what you want uh, to be. And I have plenty of examples I could, I could share with you about that. Um, but I think that that's become during the pandemic um, incredibly important because communities, you know, I've seen some communities that are doing fine and I'll talk about that too, but um, many are really struggling and suffering and losing a lot of businesses and have a lot of vacancies. And they're now thinking, how do we fill them? What do we want what do we want to be after this is all behind us and we suddenly have you know depressed real estate values and uh, we don't want real estate investment trusts coming in and you know scarfing up all the property and doing what they want to with it how do we control that um, what business composition do we want is this an opportunity for us to really change and pivot mm -hmm. um, so I think having that clear vision is uh, a first really important thing. And then of course, doing, you know, putting the tools and resources in place to actively shape that. Um, the market will invariably, you know, take a community the way that the market wants to. Um, but if the community would prefer for the market not to take it that way, uh, it has to do things to make it not happen um, or to guide it in the direction that it wants to. So that, that then comes into play of making sure that you've got the right tools and resources. Um, and of course, having, you know, commitment from, you know, institutions and government and citizens that everybody, yeah, this is the direction we want to pursue, that's critical. And that's a whole other piece of, you know, sort of shaping this vision and getting it in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you, um, 
I don't know if you can speak to this, but like what other uh, communities have you worked with that have been innovative in terms, like where they are a tourism town and they've had to be creative mm -hmm. about being accessible to visitors? What success stories have you seen? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I hate to say this, but I think they're actually more um, tragedies than there are successes in this um, because there are lots of communities that, uh, you know, are sort of one industry communities, um, whether it's tourism or a military institution or a college or whatever it might be um, that, you know, if, if they become so dependent on that one industry, they're very susceptible to disruption um, and a lot of things can happen. So I, I think that communities that sort of start you know, I mean, they say the best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago. It's sort of that thing. Those that have been sort of slow and steady and methodical about, yeah, here's where we are now. And here's where we want to be in 20 years. What are the, you know, tiny steps we need to take to get there and transform? Um, one of the things that I think the pandemic is doing is um, communities are panicking. Many communities are panicking and nothing gets done when you panic. You can't plan, you know, wisely and responsibly. So it really has to be not, re we, 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 we now have to jump from here to here, but we need to jump from here to here. And that's an easy thing to achieve. Um, so we can do that. Um, there are plenty of successes out there though. There are communities, not even tourism communities, but think about like um, Southern mill towns or you know, Northern mill towns, Lowell, Massachusetts, places like that, that are you know, sort of midway through a pretty dramatic transformation of you know, an industry that died um, leaving them with, you know, a huge collection of buildings that are significant and beautiful and wonderful and full of possibility, um, but not a lot of market strength to support it. Um, and through a combination of planning and good incentives and historic rehabilitation tax credits and, you know, wise ordinances and zoning overlays to incentivize certain kinds of development are, are, are kind of, you know, crawling their way back uh, and making it happen. Um, one of my favorite examples of sort of wise uh, visioning and planning is a town called Lanesboro, Minnesota. Um, I can show you some uh, some photos of it if you want, but here let me let me uh, do that. Let me share my slide, and I'll tell you Lanesboro's bizarre story. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So this is Lanesboro. It's a tiny town. It maybe has a thousand, fifteen hundred people, um, and they uh, twenty years ago, thirty years ago, you could have bought any downtown building for $5,000 or under. It was just, it was a dying town. Um, and they had a couple of industries and they have a bike path that goes through there. So you can see all the bikers who are, are coming into town now. Um, but they were losing uh, their young people. They were moving off, they were going off to college and they were not coming back. And what Lanesboro thought that they were missing was uh, an arts community. They didn't really have any arts. And they also are almost like their, their um, um, heritage is, 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 is Norwegian. Um, and that was almost like not talked about anymore. And they thought that if they could kind of root people in the story of their, of their origin, of their genesis, um, it might keep some of the young people. So they decided what they needed was a theater. They didn't have a theater. Um, they uh, went to these two guys who were high school teachers and they said, we want you to start a theater. And they're like, we don't know anything about theater. What are you talking about? Um, but they said, no, we, 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 we you know, um, um, and want you to do it. So they were like, okay, we'll try to make it happen. They did the most amazing sort of planning job. Um, they uh, figured out that just year by year, they could do one small thing to build towards, you know, earning enough money to buy a building and create a physical theater, but they were going to do sort of virtual theater in the main, in, in the meantime. Um, I cannot seem to get my slide. There we go. So this is the theater that they have now. It's called the Commonwealth Theater. Uh, and I'll get, I'll get, that's, that's, that's like a, um, I'm sort of at the at the end of the story. Um, what they decided to do was year by year to add little tiny things. So you know they started with doing um, theater classes for high school students, and you know they would do a poetry festival and blah blah blah. They eventually like built up to doing this Ibsen festival, which is a huge deal now. It's in its twentieth year and it attracts people from all over the world uh, to come there. And they sort of uh, took this theme of. Uh, theater and sort of melded it into every aspect of the community. So like, here's one of their lighting stanchions um, and it has a little haiku on it, you know, corn staring at stars, soybeans sitting in the sun, wheat in the soil, written by somebody in Preston, Minnesota. Just really kind of beautiful expressions of um, appreciation for the place that they are. Um, they got these old phone booths and had uh, local uh, storytellers record stories and you go into the phone booth, um, 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 
and push a button and you hear a story that's recorded that's a, that's um, I'm read to you. Um, and of course it spawned a bunch of spin-off businesses. So they have uh, some, uh, uh, um, a couple of art galleries now. They have a few more restaurants because they have, you know, incrementally a few more visitors. People are coming there. And so they have a little bit more market demand than they would have before. That's one of the good things about a tourist economy, by the way, is that it, it, it makes it possible for the community to have businesses that it wouldn't have had otherwise because of that extra slush of money. There are some drawbacks too that we can talk about. But um, anyway, so this is how they, they, they went through it. In 1989, they made the decision to uh, develop a theater. In 1991, they had a student matinee program that they introduced in 92. So let me go back here, you know, two years in planning before anything actually happened. Mm -hmm. uh, a two week long immersive training that they did, rotated repertory season the next year. Two years later, they launched a radio company uh, that broadcast throughout the Midwest. Uh, and then it just kind of rolled, touring productions, elder care collaboration, the Ibsen Festival, a new play, play series that they do, artist residency program, and then they finally uh, were able to open a new theater. Um, the thing I love about it is just that it's so, uh, it was so careful and thoughtful um, and balanced. You know, they still have a huge agricultural industry and they have a couple of like traditional industries in the community that make things, manufacturers. Um, so this is kind of like an added spice, um, but it all began with a pretty clear vision that everybody shared um, and it rolled in that direction. So I think that's really the most important part of any of this is just agreeing this is what you want the community to be. And I think Nantucket, you know, you've got, you know, you've gone through a couple of big transitions before where you were, you were once a whaling community. Well, where's that, where, where's that industry now? Um, yeah. Doesn't yeah. exist. I so, actually, in kind of preparation for this, um, I read, and you can, everyone can get this at the library, it's the making of Nantucket. And it's about that period of when whaling was, kind of going by the, they were watching, I mean, you could just see the numbers going down. It was like 300 ships and then like a hundred ships and just no more ships. Um, and there were people that early on were saying, maybe we need to come up with something else. Yeah. Um, <laughs> resilience in your bones. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's something I've been thinking about too, when you, um, like our downtown, and we do have an organization out here called um, Remain Nantucket, is one thing I notice when I walk around in the winter is, and we are a tourist town, is a lot of spaces are empty in the winter. And then in the summer, we do end up with a lot of real estate offices on Main Street. We have a lot of very high-end restaurants. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of galleries. And in the communities where you've seen successful, uh, that are successful and revitalized, what kind of businesses do they have on their Main Streets, on their downtown streets? Oh, well, you know, kind of, uh, well, pre-pandemic, I would say kind of everything. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, I think it's going to change. Before the pandemic, online sales accounted for about 10% of all retail purchases in the country, and now it's up to about 17. And that's happened in just, you know, what, seven, eight months. So um, it's accelerating quickly, and that completely changes the market dynamics. Um, but, you know, all kinds of, you know, sort of, you know, soup to nuts retail businesses, professional, personal services, businesses, um, all of those things. Um, one of the things I think is important in communities where you have a seasonal tourism traffic. Um, I worked in Cooperstown, New York a few years ago, for example, and there it's all about summer and then in the winter it's, you know, dead. Um, and the storefronts are literally like closed off because the property owners only want that one baseball focused tenant in there and that's it, um, is to keep the storefronts active and lively so that the downtown feels, or the entire you know, community feels more alive and you don't sense the vacancy quite as much um, as you might if it were just you know, closed off and the door were, were shut. Um, let me show you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. These are things that I've seen happening during the pandemic uh, in communities that really are, I think, doing a pretty good job at, at reshaping marketing activities, which you know, used to be have a festival and bring everybody downtown. Well, that's not happening now. So how can you keep people engaged and entertained let me show you a couple of things that are video things. Um, oh, wait, I have to share my slide on that. Share the screen. I could see it, you couldn't, that's not helpful. So this is um, a vacant storefront window. And uh, what they did, this was actually in a, sort of a promotion for a men's clothing store. Uh, and what they did was they had this, you know, athletic guy uh, film these, you know, 
jumps and things against a green screen. They have a, 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 a scrim like you'd use in theater. Inside the storefront window, there's a little motion sensor on the sidewalk and it's all triggered to you know, activate this video loop that they have when somebody walks by. So some people like walk by it and don't even notice it. Um, some people walk by it and just stare at it for hours and hours and can't believe what's happening. Um, but it, it makes the storefront come alive. Um, and that's, you know, here's, this guy's gonna watch it. Um, and here's how they did it. This is the green screen they filmed it against. And this is the setup. It's like, you can do this with things that you have at the Athenaeum, you know, um, a, a, a laptop computer, the laptop, the, the projection screen, the scrim, uh, the motion sensor, and that's kind of it um, to make it happen. Um, I think I have another example. If I can make this play. Yeah, this is, um, uh, you know, they have these scarves hanging and they have these video screens with these videos of women. And uh, when it gets to the part of the video where they're blowing, there's a little tiny fan that's positioned just out of view that makes the scarves ripple. Um, that makes the district seem not so vacant in off seasons um, when uh, things are happening, aren't happening there. So I think that's that's the kind of thing, and it doesn't have to be video, of course. It can just be you know all kinds of things, but 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 certainly enlivening those storefronts um, in the off season is important. And if the storefront is technically occupied but just closed for the season, um, things like that scrim are very doable um, because the the storefront can still be closed, but there can be some activity. I want to invite anyone that has questions to go ahead and put it in the Q&A, um, but I also have more questions. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, we are, uh, it is undeniable we're in the pandemic and it's changed everything. It's almost like, do you mean now or when we were back and things were normal? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I, um, I am an unshakable optimist. And when this first happened and we thought the building at the Athenaeum would shut down, I went into Amy and I'm like, this is an opportunity. Um, and we're gonna do virtual programs. Um, so I I'm wondering where you see opportunities for towns and communities to really be forced into leveraging things they hadn't done before. And I don't know, just creating opportunities for themselves mm -hmm. that they wouldn't otherwise. Well, you know, it's really, it's an interesting question and it's an interesting uh, point. And there's a lot, uh, there are a lot of things there. I and mean, one is something I've already mentioned is that communities are really rethinking who they are now. Like, what does this mean for, you know, the office market? If people are really working from home now all the time, um, does that mean we're not going to have demand for office space? And what do we do with that space? What does it mean if we have a, you know, a neighborhood shopping center that's now dead? What do we do with that, with that land? Um, so there's some rethinking going on. There's also a lot of new skills that are being developed. You know, I've been preaching for years about the importance of businesses being online and having, you know, more distribution channels than just people walking into a storefront. You know, I don't care if it's a vending machine or if it's a store in store sales, you rent square footage inside somebody else's business and sell something, or it's, you know, you're wholesaling something to another retail business, whatever it is, you know, do it never got any traction. I can't tell you how many times I've talked about, you know, you know, calling the store and ordering something and then picking it up curbside. Nobody did it. Now everyone, everyone does it. So just like that, you know, all of a sudden businesses, especially retailers and restaurants, uh, know a completely different way to work. Um, and I think that there's enormous um, potential in there. And also everybody is rethinking their business plans and figuring out how do we make my business work. Um, and there are some people who've, I mean, there are plenty of, you know, entrepreneurs are amazing and think of incredible things. And I've seen over the years, pre-pandemic, some really amazing business concepts. Um, one that I really love is, uh, I met this woman in Keokuk, Iowa once. Um, Keokuk is not a tourist town by any stretch of the imagination. Their big industry is a, a corn syrup factory that they have, um, but they're on the Mississippi River and they get a couple of visitors, you know, who come because they're on the Mississippi and they also are like a major center for geodes and uh, they're on Lock and Dam 19, which is the sort of the southernmost point that bald eagles fly in the winter. So they get people there to come look at the bald eagles and pick up geodes. So that dozen people, you know, that's about it. But anyway, I met this woman who had an antique store. She had been a reporter for the local newspaper, always wanted an antique store, opened an antique store thinking it was going to attract all these visitors, you know, not 
happening, no visitors. So she was having dinner with her brother-in-law one night and her sister, and her brother-in-law was a, um, a civil engineer for the town. And she was asking how things were going. And he said, oh, it's just awful. He says, we have this new you know, water main we're putting in and we have these sewage lines to replace. And when you, um, you know, put in a water line or a sewer line, you have these places where you have to step up the pipe from this, this diameter to this diameter. And you have to buy a washer and a nut and a, you know, a tightening thing for each of those connections. And you can't buy just one, you have to buy a gross of them. And they're expensive. And he says, and we're, you know, we have 13,000 people, we're a tiny town, we can't afford all those things. So she was thinking, okay, so there's, you know, 24,000 communities in the country that have 15,000 or fewer people, um, they must have the same problem. So she gets a shrink wrapping machine and uh, sort of cordons off her antique shop. So the first third of it is antiques. The back third of it is this sort of factory, this one person factory where she was buying all of these grosses of different sizes of these step up rings and nuts and assembling them on a, on a piece of cardboard and shrink wrapping them and sending them out all over the world. She had this massive international business from the back of her antique shop. Clever, you know, so clever. It's, you know, I mean, dry cleaners have done it for years. They're, they're busy, you know, they have lots of walk-in traffic in the morning and the evening rush hours rush hours. Um, but then in the daytime, they're slow. So they do their alterations and tailoring then. So it's that kind of like adaptation. In the pandemic, everybody is catching on to that. Everybody is catching on to, oh yeah, I need to really rethink uh, how I work and where the opportunities are in this. And there are plenty of opportunities. The other good thing is I think that communities are having a real uh, awakening about the importance of locally owned businesses and small businesses and how they really, they are crucial. Um, I have been tracking news articles for six months now, eight months um, about all the things that are pandemic related. And I have seen tens of thousands of articles about the importance of small businesses and not one about the importance of chains, not one not a single one. So I think that that's going to reshape communities' economic development strategies too. They're gonna to be sort of building their, their planning laws and their incentives around um, protecting those businesses and helping really enrich that small business community. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a comment and a question. Um, uh, Nantucket is seeing an increase in real estate sales for people who can buy homes here to work remotely at their jobs in major metropolitan areas. What does the town need to do to support this new demographic and create a new economy? Um, a work from home economy, not just a tourism based economy. Yeah, well, I think it's, you know, that, that thing I mentioned a little while ago about, you know, sort of planning as if you're, you're, you know, sort of putting together a business mix for residents and not a business mix for visitors um, is what's going to support that. You know, you need to have grocery stores and places to get your shoes repaired and, you know, places to pick up some hardware, all those things um, that you would need on, 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 a, on a kind of um, 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 daily basis are the things that will support that work from home uh, sector, which is uh, has grown very quickly and I think is not going to go back. Um, here in the Washington DC area, uh, downtown Washington's office buildings are still only 15% occupied now post, post pandemic because people just aren't going back. And their companies are realizing, why should we spend all this money on you know, office rent when people are even more productive working at home. So I think it's permanent and it wouldn't surprise me at all if you see a big influx um, of that now. So again, just the daily staples, you know, great restaurants that are, you know, unique one of a kind places. Those are the things that are gonna make locals uh, happy and that will make visitors happy too, once they can come back. Yeah, I think um, I've also heard the same thing about people and we saw it right away, um, people wanting to support local businesses and, um, you know, because you know these people, like these are the people that their kids go to school with your kids and you know them, you're friends with them and you just hate to see someone not like see their business go under. Right. Um, but then there is, especially out here, that price differential of like, oh, it's so expensive to buy it locally. But um but also understanding why it's cheaper, like why Amazon's cheaper, why Walmart's cheaper. And, that, and you had mentioned earlier the, you know, what your dollar does in a community when you spend it there. Yeah. And I, I guess like, what argument do you make for shopping locally and overcoming that price gap of buying locally as opposed to buying online or getting it like cheap? Yeah. I mean, the thing is that we're all going to pay for it eventually anyway. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, think about how you want to pay for it. 
you know, do you want to support your neighbor or do you want to support Jeff Bezos and make him richer? Um, and that's kind of what it comes down to. I was looking at, when, at these at these restaurant apps the other day and Postmates this week, Uber Eats completed its, its buyout of Postmates. It's an all stock deal that values Postmates at $2.7 billion, $2.7 billion. Um, where's that coming from? It's coming from, from locally owned restaurants that are paying those fees and they're going right to the venture capitalists and the equity investors who, um, you know, bought those companies. So it's, 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 it's wealth extraction instead of wealth generation. Um, one of the things that is crucial to, you know, solid, uh, diverse, sustainable economic development is uh, growing from within um, and supporting, you know, making a commitment as a community to supporting locally owned uh, businesses of all kinds. Um, because in the end, we're all going to pay for it, whether it's through lower wages or higher taxes or it's, 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 it, it, it always invariably comes back. Yeah. Um, we have a couple more questions. Let's see. I assume there are examples of the success and failure of closing retail, quote unquote, retail, retail main streets to um, vehicle traffic. Is there a prevailing wisdom on this? I'd say there's prevailing confusion on it. Uh, right now, um, you know, at the in the uh, 1960s, we had 220 pedestrian streets in the U.S. You know, communities went all crazy in the 50s and 60s, wanting to compete with shopping malls and close regional shopping malls, and so communities closed off their main streets and they covered up their facades with, you know, aluminum sheets to look like they were a monolithic building and did all these crazy things, um, and it killed it killed businesses um, because you went from having you know a drive-through traffic of 10,000 cars a day to suddenly having, you know, 500 people who were right there in the immediate vicinity who could walk, who, who could um, 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 and walk around. Uh, so many communities have taken them out. There are only about 15 or 20 left. Now the pandemic comes and everybody, you know, restaurants need outdoor dining and streetlets and parklets. And so they're coming back. And we've been recommending that communities not make them permanent yet, that we sort of wait and see, is this gonna be a trend that lasts, you know? How long is it going to be that people are going to feel not safe going and dining in a restaurant, or it's not going to be safe to dine in a restaurant? Um, what do you do in the winter? You know, how can you make that work? So, um, I think the jury is still very much out. Um, the good thing about it is that certainly communities are, uh, you know, have a lot more foot traffic now. People are biking more. There's more pedestrian activity. Um, we'll see if it sticks around. I'm a little skeptical, but we'll see. So make, make the improvements temporary for the time <laughs> um, being, hedge your bets. <laughs> There's another question. If one wanted to drive across the country and visit towns that have successfully remade themselves, like yeah. Lanesboro, is there a good resource for that list? Oh, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I wish somebody had a book about it, but um, I haven't seen one. But, but um, something that I would recommend is uh, looking at the communities that have won the Great American Main Street Award, which has been around for... 20, 25 years, uh, and they usually select between three and five communities a year. And those are places that have sort of shown over the long haul that they have uh, made a great transformation. So just Google Great American Main Street Awards and look at those places. I think they're all wonderful examples. Um, let's see, there's another comment here. Should rural communities invest in broadband to support a work from home world? It seems that everyone is online for learning, working and um, recreating. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the demands on internet service for the, 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 this uh, pandemic have been you know, more than anyone I think would have ever predicted. And uh, communities are scrambling to do exactly that now to put great broadband networks in place. And it's not just people working from home who need it, but small businesses need it because they are pivoting uh, more to online sales now than they ever were before. So it's it's absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. Who um, or what businesses would you say, and who do we need to keep in mind that's getting left behind, and maybe a you know doesn't have the voice or the visibility of your average small business owner? Oh well, um, that's a uh, an expansive question, but certainly any uh, businesses that uh, whose owners. Uh, are traditionally unbanked or underbanked, which tend to be businesses owned by minorities, women, um, sometimes veterans. Uh, they need extra special attention to make sure that they really are getting the, 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 the resources they need, the access to capital. Um, one of the things that has happened in the pandemic is that a lot of communities have put programs together specifically for those sort of underbanked 
uh, undercapitalized businesses, and that's great. Uh, and they seem to be having some permanence. I see, I see them being launched now with three to five year horizons, so they're they're not going away, um, and that's a that's a good thing. Um, businesses that are uh, that were probably considering a transition before the pandemic need special attention. Um, they might be businesses that uh, the owners were, you know, toying around with the idea of retiring, or you know, the pandemic has been so severe that they just don't have the energy to kind of, you know, put the pieces back in place. They need special attention, and perhaps helping them uh, put together a transition plan, um, whether it's having the employees of the business buy the business, finding a new owner for it. Um, I'm finding a lot of communities are all of a sudden in the past few weeks I've seen this are putting together sort of community collaboratives that that buy the businesses temporarily with a plan to then you know take the time to find a new owner um, and 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 you know get back their their um, um, an investment after that. So I think that they need some special uh, care and attention. Um, There's certainly going to be some triage you know, here there are some businesses that aren't going to make it or the owners just don't have the stomach to kind of get back into it. Um, and I think it's worth thinking of those as opportunities to reshape the uh, business composition of the community rather than thinking of them as failures, but really thinking of them as opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, what would you say to someone who's starting a small business right now? <laughs> Good luck. Uh, <laughs> Um, no, I, I would say, you know, um, if someone's starting a small business now, they're, they're hopefully thinking through, we need to do business in a different way. You know, I need to have a business plan that sort of, you know, has, you know, the in-store sales, the online sales, the, you know, remote sales, all of these different channels mapped out and has a strategy for each of those. And I think anyone starting a business now knows that. I think they would be uh, sort of crazy not to. Um, it's important to think about how they capitalize their business. Um, I think that one of the things we've learned in this is that this is not a good time for businesses to take on, whether it's a new business or an established one, to take on debt, um, but instead to look for equity, uh, whether it's in the form of a grant or community investment. Um, and there are lots of communities that are now doing, you know, uh, sort of stock ownership programs, uh, stock ownership corporations that invest in, you know, strategically invest in local businesses to help them launch or keep them afloat or help them grow and pivot. Um, there's some great examples. There's a community in uh, Wisconsin called Port Washington that has a company called uh, Renew Port Holdings, I think it is, um, which is, you know, people buy shares of stock for 500 bucks and they pool that money and invest it strategically in business and property development projects um, that the community decides that they want to support. Um, and so I think that we're going to see some of that happening. But certainly, I think new businesses have to think about, do I have the capital or the access to capital or the equity partners to help me really get through the next couple of years? Um, and communities can help with that too. I saw a great program in, in um, Winston-Salem, North Carolina a few years ago. They called it their Restaurant Row Program. They had a block of buildings on the edge of their downtown, which was completely vacant. Um, and kind of derelict people were, you know, vandalizing the buildings, the windows were broken, they were getting graffitied and um, the city knew that, it, that, 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 you know, something had to change. So they thought that if they could get, because they had enough market demand to support some new restaurants, if they could get uh, six or seven restaurants to open there, that it would be enough of a critical mass to help kind of turn the, turn the corner. So they went to establish restaurateurs. They didn't want people who didn't know what they were doing um, and asked if they would open a second restaurant there on this block. Uh, they went to local financial institutions uh, and uh, who committed to providing 70% of the capital needed to get the businesses started. Um, and the restaurateur had to put in 30% of their own money. Uh, they got seven restaurants to open there. Um, the kicker was that the city used some of its community development block grant money. It could have been any funding, but they used about a million and a half dollars of CDBG money to basically pay for the first two years uh, of, of um, 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 debt service uh, for those 70% loans. It's really expensive starting a restaurant. The equipment, the furnishings, uh, cost a fortune and the time that it takes to build up a clientele. Um, it could be a couple of years. It wasn't a, a, a gift. Uh, the restaurant had to pay the city back at the end of its 10 year loan term, but it gave the restaurants breathing room. They didn't have this massive crushing debt to pay back uh, for a couple of years. And that's what it took to make them succeed. Um, so communities can do those kinds of things too. And I think it's really crucial to help get new businesses established. What, um, this is kind of a bigger question, but like, 
what needs to happen at the top in terms of you know federal help um, to kind of get our small towns and small businesses back on track? I mean, I, I don't know. A lot of people are speculating like, on different things, but it, we do need money. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, it's absolutely essential, and I really hope Congress gets its act together in the next week or so to make that happen, um, because this is a global pandemic. It's not something that happens every day, um, and businesses have lost revenue through no fault of their own, and that, that needs compensation, just like any disaster would. Um, so it's really crucial that the federal government get money out there as fast as it can, um, and it has to be in the form of grants, you know, loans are great for pivoting and long-range planning, but right now that's the last thing that small businesses need is to take on more debt. Um, so that's crucial. Um, and then I think you know leveling out the playing field for some of these inequities uh, is important. And Congress is already moving on that. You know, we've all seen the, you know, or heard about the big uh, antitrust committees uh, hearings with the tech giants uh, this past uh, September, I guess it was when they or October. Um, that's crucial. That the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, and Congress start looking at um, where where are the uh, you know the rough spots in the economy that are making it so that um, Amazon can dominate uh, you know Amazon Web Cloud Services or they can dominate online sales. Um, it's just not fair. Um, and it's it's again it's extracting wealth from communities and sending it off uh, to uh, these investors. So. Um, Congress can do more uh, in that direction, but uh, first priority certainly is um, uh, getting uh, uh, grant money in the hands of small businesses. Um, one of those other sort of um, inequities that drives me crazy is that in the middle of the pandemic, the General Service Administration uh, signed a contract with Amazon and um, Overstock, uh, making it just like that, that uh, federal employees can buy up to $10,000 worth of supplies from those two companies without having to uh, put it out to bid. Mm -hmm. Just crazy, crazy things. So there are a bunch of loopholes that uh, um, Congress can take care of. We just, like I said, we, we just, we just uh, um, put out a, a report this morning. Let's see if I can find the copy of it for you uh, and show you. Yeah, here it is. Um, let me share my screen. A federal policy agenda, which is completely about um, things that Congress can do and that the new administration can do within the first few months um, to uh, take out some of those inequities and begin to level to um, relevel the playing field. Uh, I'd encourage folks watching this tonight to go to our website and take a look at it, and you know, give a holler to members of Congress and say, please support these these uh, changes. Some are small tweaks, some are big. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, does anyone uh, out there have any more questions? Go ahead and put it in the Q&A in the chat. Um, something that's been um, on my mind, but also on the island's mind is inequity in terms of the economy and um, you know how much money people have, but also diversity in terms of race and gender um, in independent businesses. And once again, COVID's kind of thrown a wrench in everything, but I guess what direction was that going before the pandemic and what, um, looking through that lens, what impact has the pandemic had on people of color and women in business? Well, I mean, I think the real game changer there was um, maybe coincidental to the pandemic, but was the George Floyd killing. I mean, that has really, and that, you know, may have happened without the pandemic, who knows, but that really has um, been a wake up call for communities at you know, uh, local, state, uh, federal level, everybody is rethinking now. For some reason, that one was just one too many, and that was like the last straw. And so that has really refocused attention on um, what, why, you know, why do these massive inequities exist, and how can we change it? So, um, and you know, of the programs that I've been tracking that communities are launching, I would say probably twenty five percent are really giving special attention to businesses owned by people of color and women uh, and entrepreneurs who are interested in, in opening businesses. And that's great. I think there's gonna be a lot of support in the years going forward um, and that's really crucial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, we have another question. Oh, they say great program. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, were there any stories or anecdotes or information you had on par that you wanted to share with us that you hadn't shared already? Uh, let's see. Um, 
One thing I think is uh, probably important for communities as we sort of em hopefully are emerging from the pandemic and looking ahead um, is sort of tapping into local talent for new business ideas. Um, there's, you know, entrepreneurs are just have ingenious ideas. Um, and I've, I've, you know, been privileged to see some amazing businesses with amazing business concepts. But one that uh, I was thinking of this morning for some reason was um, this guy in Texas who had a um, uh, a tailoring shop. He did like, he would make like custom wedding dresses and bridesmaids dresses and things like that. Um, and a couple of years ago when that factory collapsed in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. it occurred to him, ah, I think this might be the catalyst that makes clothes, you know, um, 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 US clothing labels rethink uh, how their clothes are manufactured. And I think we're gonna find people wanting to bring those um, product lines back here, production. So he called around, talked to people from some clothing labels and found out that, yeah, if you could, you know, ramp up production and make it so we could buy stuff from you for, you know, small to medium sized lots, we would consider doing that. So we partnered with a community college and taught people how to be sort of commercial clothing makers um, and expanded from his two person shop to now what is a 20 person shop. Um, and he got a, a, a big contract with Jones, New York. Um, just a great, a great success story. Um, and it was all because of his, his, his interest and his ingenuity. So I think it's really great to sort of ask people, what business ideas do you have? You know, maybe you aren't the person to do it, but if you think it's a good idea that works for here, let's explore it. Let's find a way to make that happen. Let's put the people with the talent together with people with the money, um, and kind of create that, that business mix. So I think that that's an important thing to think about is what local talent might you have. I also think it's always important with um, communities that are that are heavily dependent on tourism um, to, you know, like I said, you know, think about how would you develop the communities and, and its, its business composition to serve locals, uh, full time residents, because that will be appealing to tourists. Um, but it's also important to remember that that kind of that um, uh, tourism economies, unless you're very careful, uh, they tend to stifle economic diversity and creativity. Um, tourism begets tourism businesses. Um, is it better to have one more art gallery or to have a hardware store um, in the long run? So I think that's really important to uh, think about. Um, and I think that it's important to think about local ownership and making sure that uh, businesses and buildings are to the extent possible um, owned locally. Um, there are a couple of litmus tests that I usually like to sort of uh, use and try out in my mind when I'm working with a community. Um, one of them is there's a uh, some may know this, some may not. There's a uh, system called the North American Industry Classification System, which is a you know digits system, sort of like the Dewey Decimal System, um, for industries. And um, it, they go from you know uh, uh, um, eleven up to ninety two, um, and break down into two, three, four, five, six digits. Um, retail is forty four and forty five. Um, restaurants are seventy two. Um, I like to sort of do a business inventory and see. If I have more than 25%, if more than 25% of the businesses in this community fall into one of those categories, we have a problem. Um, it's the, 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 the economy just isn't diverse enough. Um, then I also look at, at ownership of business and properties. And if uh, more than, uh, if, if less than 75% are locally owned, there could be a problem. And then finally, the last litmus test is can the people who work here afford to live here? Um, and those three things, I think if you can answer those questions um, and find a way to, you know, make sure that yes, people can work and live here, that yes, we have diversity among the NAICS codes, and yes, we're locally owned, you have a pretty healthy economy. And what, um, if you don't, what are the remedies? Well, that's the, here we are, we're starting here and we wanna be here, you know, in 10 years, 20 years. So what are the steps we need to take to get there? You know, slow and steady wins the race. There, yeah. there are no catalytic projects that are gonna come in and bang, solve it. You've gotta just take it step by step. So right. maybe that means, you know, you, you find ways when a vacancy opens up um, for the business owner to own that building um, mm -hmm. or you find ways to, um, you know, when there's a vacancy, instead of filling it with another tourist related retail business, um, you find a way to, you know, put the right, the right business in there. It could be that you, you buy a, 
um, you know, a rent option for six months on the building so the property owner is getting some rent, but it gives the community time to find the right tenant for the building that's going to really support the overall retail mix. Shopping malls do that all the time. Shopping malls are so intentionally planned. Every single business there is there because it's a good co-tenant for the business on this side and that side. It's going to generate traffic for this demographic group and not that demographic group. Everything is engineered. And we tend to not do that when it comes to um, downtowns, independently owned businesses, neighborhood shopping centers. We kind of let it, let the market dictate what it's going to be. It doesn't need to be that way. We can actually control it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we do have a lot of economic disparity out here on the island. And uh, I think everyone's feeling a lot of chaos right now. Like there's just been like upheaval everywhere. Yeah. Um, and change doesn't happen have to happen like that. It can be incremental. But I mean, what do you see as some of the the steps backwards from that much disparity? Like, you know, this many people have a whole bunch of money. These people are leaving the island because they can't afford to live here. Like, how do you walk it back? What do you do? Well, I mean, that's a that's a long, long conversation. But like I say, you know, vision, you know, getting people together to say, okay. This is a reset button we have just hit. You know, everything is everything could be different going forward. What do we want? Um, if that disparity is a problem, uh, it has to be a priority to create local wealth and not send it offshore. Um, so, what is leaving? What is going offshore? And how can we bring it back here um, to make that happen? Let's prioritize affordable housing programs. You know, let's. Yeah, it'd be great to do that project down the road, but let's focus on this. It's a it's an important priority. And you can incentivize property owners to do that. You can incentivize developers to do it. It's very doable. Lots of communities have done it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we had a comment. Uh, we need to think about new residents coming here, whether they are 12, 9, or 6 months. Um, but they're moving here to work from home and they need services. So, yeah, I think... I think um, she's also Janet, um, is uh, think about what services people need. We have a lot of uh, new people coming, so. Yeah, no, it's 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 um, a definitely an opportunity and ask them, you know, do surveys, do interviews, talk to them and see what they need. Mm -hmm. um, that can be great insight. Uh, newcomers see communities in different ways than people who've lived there for a while. So their insights are gonna be valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's great that you're, you know, the kind of community people want to come to. They want to move move there. That's great. Yeah. Well, I did see, I think it was in the New York Times, um, now's the big test because there were a lot of people that left the cities and moved to rural Vermont or rural New Hampshire and moved to Nantucket. And uh, you can't dine outdoors and things are closing down and the big test is coming <laughs> for a lot of people that are um, new to our rural area uh, going into the winter. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. The um, the winter thing is interesting. There, um, you know, communities are again trying to be creative and find ways to solve this, like outdoor dining in in cold climates. And uh, um, I've talked to some of the people at the Winter City Institute, which is you know headquartered in Edmonton. You know, they know cold. They really know cold. And they're like, ah, you know, thirty degrees, not a problem. Here's what you do. You know, but um. Communities are starting to do some creative things. There was this community that I, I came across years ago in uh, Michigan, Holland, Michigan. And Holland, um, in 1985, when they got involved in downtown revitalization was, you know, they had a, I don't know, 80% ground floor vacancy rate. It was just a pitiful, pitiful downtown. Um, one business that they had that was doing fine was called the Hall of Foam. It was a, a bar and they had like 500 kinds of beer. And if you drank them all, you know, over a period of time, you got your name on the Hall of Foam. So I was in there one night uh, getting their downtown revitalization pro pro program going. Uh, and the city manager was there also. I didn't know who he was. And the uh, Main Street manager uh, was talking to him and said, you know, thank you for getting us that block grant money to repave the downtown sidewalks and streets. The manager said, great, no problem, happy to do it. The guy on the next stool, uh, turns out, was the manager of the local power plant. And he said, did I hear you say that you were going to repave the downtown streets and sidewalks? And they said, yeah. And he says, you know, we've been trying to find a way to expand the cooling capacity for the power plant. So when the streets are torn up, what if we put all this copper and PVC pipe down 
and then you paved over it. It would be a cooling loop for us and a radiant heating system for the sidewalks. And they were like, great idea. And in the morning they remembered it um, and they did it. They call it their snow melt system and they have no snow or ice on the downtown streets in Holland in the winter. Um, within five years, they had a thousand housing units downtown because everybody wanted to be there all of a sudden. Now with the pandemic, I am seeing communities you know, come out of the woodwork doing exactly that because they're seeing radiant heating as a way to keep outdoor dining um, doable uh, in the winter. So I think those are the communities that are just by coincidence, it's time to repave their streets. Um, but I think we're gonna see tons of creative ideas like that coming out of this um, that are gonna make our communities better, more resilient places for the long haul. And that's mm -hmm. kind of cool. I think you might've shared this story and, and just let me know if I'm making it up, but um, was there a restaurant that teamed up with a bookstore in their outdoor dining? There, there are there are there are a bunch of restaurants that have teamed up with sort of adjacent um, businesses. So there, there, there is. I'm trying to think of where it is. I think it's in Michigan, um, not Holland. I forgot the name of the town. But yeah, they did this where uh, the bookstore just put like piles of books on the outdoor tables, and people could like browse through books as they're eating their meals. And it was great for everybody. It's basic co merchandising um, is what it is, and that's a another great retail sales category, uh, uh, um, sales distribution channel for for businesses. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. Well, I just, we had this one, um, I mean, a lot of our restaurants kind of bled out onto the streets this year and people were like, Oh, it's like Paris. And, but I noticed the barricades. And when I heard that, I was like, Oh, what if we had bookshelves yeah. everywhere, like dividing people up? And Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, one of the, 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 the keys to keeping outdoor dining, um, doable is windbreaks. So mm -hmm. why not use book bookshelves? It's a great idea. <laughs> great. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments before we wrap up? I guess I should ask you, Kennedy, do you have any thoughts or comments before, words of wisdom before we wrap up? I think I've, uh, I think I've, I've covered a lot of what I wanted to cover. I mean, the, you know, I think the most important thing is really to remember this is a, a moment to rethink uh, where we're headed um, and to think about doing things differently. People are uh, people who would never have thought about being so collaborative before are suddenly being very collaborative. Businesses are much sharper and more savvy now than they were a year ago. So it's a great time to, you know, come together and think about what do we want and what changes can we make, big or small, over, you know, the next year, five year, ten years, to make this place even more wonderful. Yeah, I appreciate that you're in a position seeing the numbers and you could be really devastated. And I appreciate your hopefulness and optimism <laughs> as we go through as we go through this. So I, I really appreciate your time and I, I really appreciate the organization. You can learn about the work that Kennedy Smith does at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. It's ILSR.org. They also have a podcast. Um, that is building strong uh no it's a uh, building local power um and they talk about all you know all five of the the sectors that they work in the the areas that they cover so i highly recommend it um thank you everyone for joining and thank you for your comments and questions and have a wonderful evening everyone <laughs>